Miss Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. Okay, I'm my back. So I have to sit down. But I'll be blocking you. Don't worry. It seems that other people have stood on, leaned on. That's a silly protocol. So I hope you will permit me to lie down. <laughs> When the list of my honorary degrees were being read out, a very intelligent person turned to me and said, Na only you waka come. Yeah. <laughs> Not only you waka come. <laughs> this is an absolute honor for me to be here to deliver this keynote speech at the conference of the Nigerian Bar Association. I consider myself to be standing before some of the greatest minds that Tell this continent them. has ever produced. Tell them. And I was, I was amused when, while recently reading the social history of medicine in the United States, to come across the sentence that read, American medicine a century ago was for people considered too immoral for the pulpit and too stupid for the bar. Wow. Wow. But I'm sure the Nigerian Medical Association will have a few serious views on that sentence. But of course, the larger point is that I want to start by acknowledging the great regard in which the legal profession is held. And as a consequence, how apt the theme of this year's conference, Bold Transitions, is. In his address, the chair of the Technical Committee on Conference Planning, Tobinde Orejikwe, who, by the way, happens to have grown up on the campus of the University of Nigeria as I did. There was something in the water that we drank. <laughs> Tobinde spoke of the disruptive transitions such as technology and access to data that continue to significantly change the way we live. I'm a writer, a lover of language, a lover of words, and I like to describe myself using a word that is the title of Robert McNeil's memoir, Words Struck. And so I could not help but be struck by the word disruptive. Some words seem to capture particular zeitgeists, and this word disruptive seems to speak to the spirit of our age. Traditionally, disruptive has often been used in a negative sense. So we have many primary school teachers who have reprimanded students for being disruptive in class. Traditional synonyms for disruptive include troublesome, disorderly, unsettling, troublemaking. But today, disruptive has taken on a more positive and perhaps even a trendy connotation. It now tends to mean innovative <laughs> and original, especially concerning technology and access to information. Troublesome and innovative. They might seem opposed to each other, but I would argue that these two understandings of disruptive can be applied to the Nigerian Bar Association. So, troublesome. Many people who have abused their positions of power in Nigeria would describe the Nigerian Bar Association as troublesome. To me, this is worthy of applause. <laughs> Throughout history, those who have maintained principal positions and fought for justice have often been viewed as troublesome. Yeah. 
Even the principal figures of Christianity and Islam were considered troublesome in their time. But a potential problem with the word troublesome is the assumption that the troublesome action is itself the point. The American journalist Adam Sewa wrote about many of the cruel policies of President Trump's government. And to the question, why would this administration be so cruel? His conclusion was, the cruelty is the point. But in this case, the disruption is not the point. The troublemaking is not the point. What matters is not that we are troublesome. What matters is why we are troublesome. The remarkably humane and resilient African-American civil rights leader, John Lewis, often spoke of the necessity of making good trouble, which I understand to mean not trouble for the sake of making trouble, but trouble to achieve a greater good and in this case, justice. The Nigerian Bar Association was troublesome during Nigeria's years of military rule because of your long-standing tradition of fighting for human rights, fairness, and equity for the good of the Nigerian people. During the NSAS protests, the Nigerian Bar Association spoke out firmly about the illegal and immoral use of force and outlined clear steps to prevent its reoccurrence for the good of the Nigerian people. The vocal and wonderfully troublesome involvement of the Nigerian Bar Association in ensuring the passage of the Electoral Act and the principles but intense pressure brought to bear on the executive branch to assent to the bill was for the good of the Nigerian people. And I want to personally thank Mr. Olumide Abata for his leadership. Because actions like these reverberate and inspire others and make us see that it matters that we take a stand. We are starved of heroes in this country. So many young people are hungry for figures that they can look up to, for examples of integrity. One of my Nigerian heroes is Dr. Dora Akumile, the least the late former Director General of NAFTAC, who was also considered troublesome. Troublesome meant that she, among other things, fought the importation of fake drugs into Nigeria, that she tackled the substandard status quo of the food and drug industries, and by so doing, she saved and changed many Nigerian lives. The Nigerian legal profession is in a unique position to give us more heroes. Heroes are not angels. Heroes are not perfect human beings. Heroes are beautifully flawed. They believe in trying. They choose hope. They reject cynicism. Heroes understand that heroism is like yoga or like many other forms of physical training. Heroism is really about practice. Aristotle knew this when he wrote, we become just by performing just acts. Temperate by performing temperate acts. Brave by performing brave acts. Ghani Fawaini was a hero to so many and inspired a generation of Nigerians to want to become lawyers. But heroism does not have to be public or colorful. Every lawyer who acts to uphold the rule of law is a hero. Because
because the truth is that this country is in utter disarray. Yes. As Igbo people say, if I am a Rokolo, things are not standing well. Life is hard and getting harder for a vast majority of Nigerians. We must save the soul of our nation. And we cannot and we cannot save the soul of our nation without the people of the that stay with the ah, oh, see this, save the We nation. are delighted by insecurity yeah. all yeah. over yeah. the yeah. country. Yeah. From yeah. another yeah. state, yeah. my yeah. home state, where people are worried about holding traditional marriage ceremonies, to Kaduna State, where people are reluctant to be out on the roads. But insecurity is really a fundamental problem of the failure of the rule of law. It can sometimes seem hopeless. It can feel as though the Nigerian rot is too deep. And one can sometimes wonder why we should even bother to try to effect some positive change. But we know we can change things, no matter how small. We know that the beginning of a bold transition can sometimes take just one person. The digitization of law records in some parts of Nigeria, two so few parts of Nigeria, have often been because of the decision of one person and has resulted in massive benefits for many people. The fact, for example, that all land registry issues are in a digital directory and precedents can easily be researched increases the possibility of delivering real justice especially to those who are economically disadvantaged. And so the fact that something is difficult or unlikely is not a reason not to try. As the Swiss poet Hermann Hess wrote, so that, the so that the possible can come into being, the impossible has to be attempted again and again. A bold transition cannot begin with the premise of pessimism. It must embrace audacity, the audacity of being both troublesome and innovative. I have had the distinct pleasure of being called troublesome. <laughs> And, and because sarcasm can often be lost in speeches of this sort, I think I should clarify that I use the word pleasure sarcastically. <laughs> because of course, it is never enjoyable to be called troublesome, or controversial, or provocative. At least it isn't enjoyable to me. I have never set out to provoke for the sake of provoking. Because not only do I think that it is quite a juvenile way of being in the world, but it isn't my nature. However, I refuse to silence myself for the fear that I might inadvertently provoke. What guides me in general is never the question, will this attract criticism? But rather, the question, is this true? Do I truly believe this? And will this potentially result in a greater good? It has always been important to me to say what I believe, to speak up for causes I feel strongly about, to call out injustice. Because I know that, and I will tweak the words of our great icon, Professor Wole Shoinka, the woman dies in all who keep silent in the face of tyranny. Yeah. And I think I'd like to pause here to acknowledge that the great Professor Wole Shoinka is himself a wonderful example of troublesome. <laughs>
But it is time for us Nigerians to have a broader and more nuanced view of tyranny. The government does not have a monopoly and the cursed monopoly it would be on tyranny. Federal and state security forces dragging a journalist to prison, as continues to happen in this country, is tyranny. That journalist ill-treating his domestic worker is also tyranny. The disproportionate police targeting and murder of young men is tyranny. And the rape of women and girls by young men is also tyranny. Cultural norms that deny the right of property ownership to women is tyranny. Say it. It is tyranny. Say it. It is tyranny when state governments do not pay pensioners until those pensioners are smug and die. Say it! The physical harassment of lawyers and some judges is tyranny. And the use of the law by the rich to subjugate the poor is also tyranny. I happen to have witnessed this firsthand in my hometown of Abba in Anambra State, where a wealthy man who will remain unnamed from a neighboring town has used the law to brutalize poor people in order to take their land. And so, in this context of a more nuanced understanding of tyranny, please permit me to tell you a personal story. About two years ago, I gave a press interview in which I said that the Catholic Church in Nigeria had become too much about money. Any honest-minded person knows this is true. It is flagrantly, self-evidently true in so many churches all over this country. And the point of calling this out is so that church leaders might curtail this unchristian practice, which is driving people away from attending services. Anyway, this criticism of mine appeared to upset quite a few church leaders, not all of them, because I think it is important to note that there are a few notable church leaders who are able to acknowledge the truth in constructive criticism. Mm. But it takes just one leader who is unable to take criticism to taint, to taint the perception one has of all leaders. Some months after I gave that interview, my mother died very unexpectedly. And this not long after my father had also died unexpectedly. In fact, I had by this time forgotten about that interview. But the priest in my hometown, did not forget. a man called Christopher Esse, had not. <laughs> she called the name. <laughs> she called the name. And so, it's a personal story, so the man must be And up. so, at my mother's funeral, while my siblings and I sat in the front pew, our minds still in disbelief and our hearts broken with grief. This priest began to crudely and verbally attack me for daring to criticize the church. <laughs> Later, his bishop, his superior, who apparently was also upset that I had dared to criticize the church for being materialistic, supported this priest. I spoke privately to a number of Catholics I respected about this incident. The sort of people who speak out boldly about government corruption. And I was struck by how quick all of them were to tell me, don't talk publicly about this, don't go public. A friend 
who is no longer a friend. <laughs> who, is, who is also very outwardly religious, told me that he would take me so that we could go and beg the bishop, so that the bishop would reprimand the priest, but quietly, behind closed doors, hush, 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 for the sake of peace. <laughs> But I was not asking for peace. I was asking for justice. I, I wanted the bishop to do the right thing, to take responsibility, to reprimand the priest in the same public way that the priest had desecrated my mother's funeral, to set a precedence for consequences, and therefore make sure that no other priest would turn what is often one of the saddest days of a person's life into a venue for sickening petty sports. Anyway, that did not happen. I can tell you that as I stand here, I am still filled with a shimmering, glowering, unending rage. But why did I choose to tell you this story? Because it made me realize how often in this country we sweep aside injustice in the name of peace. fragile and hollow peace. Because as long as we refuse to untangle the knots of injustice, real peace cannot thrive. And so, and so in the name of peace, we say things like, okay, just leave it. Okay, it's enough now. Okay, it was very bad, but you should just stop talking about it. Okay, just manage it now, we don't. And by saying these, we continue to make mediocrity our norm. We fail to hold leaders accountable, and we turn... to hold leaders accountable and we turn what should be transparent systems into ugly, opaque cults. My experience also made me begin to think that there is something dead in us, something dead in our society. A death of self-awareness, a death of self-reflection, a death of compassion, a death of intellectual curiosity, a death of the ability for self-criticism. And I think it is time for a collective resurrection, so to speak. We cannot refuse to practice self-criticism and yet criticize the government. We cannot ignore the abuses by our religious, our traditional, our community leaders, and focus only on the abuses of political leaders. We cannot want to hide our own institutional failures while demanding transparency from government institutions. The first question we must ask is, what is the right thing to do? Not what is the materially beneficial thing to do, or what is the institutionally beneficial thing to do, what, what is the right thing to do? Because if we do not do this, if we continue to sweep away injustice for the sake of a hollow peace, then we will leave behind for our children and their children an utterly bleak inheritance. The Nigerian Bar Association has shown that it is capable of boldness, of good troublesomeness, with its deeply admirable tradition of fighting the abuse of executive power. But the story is incomplete without acknowledging the things 
that were and are the plight to that tradition. Many, many Nigerians are disillusioned with our justice system. They believe that justice is for sale, that we can buy justice. And they have reason to believe this. They have seen the strange judgments in the courts, whether they be on election cases or commercial cases, which do not stand the test of fairness or the test of legal reasoning. Nigerians have heard of legal retainers being obtained through bribes. They have heard of contract laws used to extort money from the government. They have heard of lawyers who compromise their own clients for money. This is not common, but it does not have to be common to be something that needs to be addressed. One is too many. It is, as a friend of mine puts it, like your own doctor deliberately giving you poison. Mm -hmm. If one single doctor deliberately gives poison to a patient, that act has consequences for the entire medical profession. Okay. Nigerians are disillusioned because they know of senior members of the legal profession who act in unbefitting ways and who do not voluntarily refuse themselves when they should. Some of us have an attack of 
patriotic shame when we visit another country and see things as basic as people simply and quietly standing in queues and we compare it to the unnecessary chaos of our public life. So I suffered an attack of patriotic shame recently when I visited Rwanda and spoke to Rwandan women who told me how very seriously the Rwandan justice system takes sexual assault. Not just in Kigali, the capital, but even in the rural areas. And it made me think of the ongoing struggles of many brave lawyers in this country. And I thank you all who want to create a system that acknowledges sexual assault as the heinous crime that it is. There are still laws in our books today that deprive women of their full human rights and are relics of a bygone era. And while I am on the subject, the important subject of women, I want to say something about an even more important subject, football. The men are like, yes, that's even more important. I, so I understand that the NBA conference will have sports competitions. Yes. And it was announced that the winning prize for the interbranch male football competition is 500,000 Naira. While the winning prize for the female football competition is 200,000 Naira. Are you serious? <laughs> I cannot think. I cannot think of a better opportunity for a bold transition. <laughs> And I just want to say very quickly that the Women's Tennis Association has been a global trailblazer in this issue. And so they had to deal with the same kinds of justifications of less sponsorship, availability, lower TV audiences, and therefore lower self-funding, and that sort of thing. But the US Open equalized the prize money in 1973, and then 34 years later, Wimbledon also equalized the prize money, despite all of these justifications. So, the Nigerian Bar Association, over to you. So, speaking of bold transitions, by this time next year, we will have a new president. Yes. It is essential for the future of Nigeria, that the elections not only be free and fair and conducted transparently in accordance with both the letter and spirit of all the laws, but that it is seen and believed by the Nigerian people yeah. to be the case. We must believe that our voices have been heard. Yeah. I know that the Nigerian Bar Association has been actively involved as the election observer, working with civil rights organizations. But your role in the upcoming elections will be critical, both in practical ways, such as you're already doing, but also legally in the court cases that inevitably follow elections in this country. Although we hope that this will not be the case this time. And so I think I can speak for many Nigerians when I say that we are counting on you to act as our collective social conscience in the upcoming elections. Finally, as I conclude this keynote speech, I want to once again thank you for inviting me. I want to thank in particular, again, Mr. Lumi Diabata, 
I want to thank um, everyone who was involved in organizing this because clearly it, just, it must have been quite a feat. I also want to thank my friend Tobinna Erojikwe. And I want to tell you a little story that I hope will embarrass Tobinna. <laughs> Tobinna and I were in secondary school together, the University of Nigeria Secondary School in Osaka. And Tobinna was known to be very intelligent. He is. I told you there's something in the water we drank in Osaka. So I made the rather dubious choice of choosing as my boyfriend someone who was not very intelligent. <laughs> and so I did not know this at the time. I learned this much later. It turned out that this person, this boyfriend of mine, who was a friend of Tobinna's, relied on Tobinna to write his love letters. Oh. <laughs> behind much of what the Nigerian Bar Association does. Compassion is one of the most powerful forces possible. And we lose a lot if we lose sight of compassion. And so as officers in the Temple of Justice, compassion is necessary to avoid the desecration of the temple. Yeah. I wish you well as you continue your conference. And may you all continue in your bold transitions. Thank you for having me.